This summer, actually, just giving all the ladies a heads up now, Father's Day is coming. It's not till the 16th, but I'm just letting you know, Father's Day is June 16th, that Sunday here. We're going to have all kinds of fun stuff. Dads are going to go home with a special gift. We're going to have root beer floats after service, so that's going to be awesome. So that'll be the 16th. And then the next announcement I want to say is that um, we're calling it Mobilize Love here, but we're going to be doing an outreach Sunday. There is a fifth Sunday this month. Whoop, whoop. And so on fifth Sunday, we always do outreach. So we will not be here in the building. We will actually be doing and serving a free lunch at Lake David Park in Groveland. So on June 30th, our whole team is going to show up. Anybody who walks into the park, we're going to be advertising it online beforehand. We're going to be doing walking tacos, hence the like taco with the legs. <laughs> so we're going to be doing walking tacos. There's a free splash pad for kids there. We'll have kids activities and games. Who uh, remembered doing that last summer. Raise your hand if you remember doing the free lunch. It was so fun. You guys, I know you're like, oh, it's hot. It's outside. I want to be in the AC. But Lake David Park always has a beautiful breeze. And if you are an adult and you want to wear your swim trunks and hop in the splash pad, no one's going to judge you, okay? We're all going to do it. We're all going to do it. It's going to be amazing. It's a free splash pad, you guys. It's not like Claremont where it makes you pay for everybody. <laughs> so we're super excited about that coming up. So that's just a little bit of announcements. Also, I did forget to say tomorrow is recess. We're super excited about that. That's an outreach that Story Church um, like sponsors, but it's not like a big church event. And so it's just for all of, we get a lot of moms who have homeschool kids um, who are new to the area over summer. We're going to get some more kids in and uh, we just do some fun games. Spencer does games with older kids. I do crafts and games with the younger kids. We hang out at the park for an hour and we just let the moms have have a morning to just talk with each other, chat, get to know each other, and have some fun so that is happening tomorrow. Um, I think that's about it for announcements. So if Sharif, you want to come up and join me, I'm going to be introducing her. I'm so excited. As we've been saying, if you have been here, then you know we have been in a series called It Runs in My Family, right? We started it on Mother's Day. We're going to end it on Father's Day, but we're talking about the it that runs in our family. We're talking about how to identify the things that are not good for us and then how to find the good things. We've talked about last week, Pastor Spencer gave a powerful message on the power of words, how words can destroy in a family or words can uplift. And so it was in May, Mental Health Awareness Month. And so we've been trying to tie a little bit of mental health through this series. But today, that's what we're going to be focusing on. So I'd love everybody to welcome Cherie. Hello. Cherie is actually my therapist. She's here in Claremont. She has an amazing, amazing practice called Healing Wounds. Healing Wounds, I know, Healing Wounds. And so I am just so excited to have her here with us today. Of course, she has made a huge impact in my life as she has walked me through some of my darkest things. But I've told her um, many times in what I feel like uh, happens in a lot of our lives is if we have Christ and something traumatic happens, or maybe not traumatic, but something happens that affects our lives in a negative way, a lot of times if you're following Christ, you can get to this level of healing spiritually. You, I can get to the place where I can walk in freedom and not carry shame or guilt because of something that I did or something that was done to me. But there's things in the natural that I still struggle with. There's things in the natural that will still cause me to stumble because of what happened in my life. And so walking through therapy and the Lord directing me to Cherie has been an amazing, amazing part of my healing in the, I would say, in the supernatural and the natural. So I want to thank you. And before we get started, I do just want to honor her. You know, it cannot be easy to be called by God to sit with people in their darkness. And it's a very special calling. Not everyone has that calling. Raise your hand if you could never do that. <laughs> that is something that is very, very hard to do. But she does it with grace and she does it with the Lord and she uses the Holy Spirit. 
And I am just so thankful for her. I'm sure my husband is so thankful for her in my life. And um, it has just allowed me to be who I am today. And uh, I'm just so thankful for how she has to do that every single day, sitting in the mess of people's lives, but trying to give them the hope of Jesus and the tools that they need to move forward. So we're going to be talking about mental health. You can grab your mic if you want to. I'm going to be, what I'm doing is we're going to do this as a Q&A instead of her just kind of coming up and having to like speak for 30 minutes. I've got some questions that I'm going to be asking her. I feel like the Holy Spirit wants me to have a little input. I will, but I'm going to be asking her these questions. These were sent in by you, and there were also some. She has done some Q&As before in other churches, and so some of them are from that, and ours are just going to have a little bit of a, a bent on family and people in our lives, in our relationships, and their mental health. Sound good? Everybody excited? Woof, woof. Mental health is something that's super important, super important super important <laughs> because it's something that touches all of our lives, whether it's you personally, your kids, your spouse, your parents, your friends, co-workers, and it's something that needs to be talked about in church. Amen? Amen. All right. So first, is there anything you want to say? Tell us about yourself, your married, kids, uh, your practice, anything you want to say before we dive in? Awesome. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so first of all, I want to just say thank you for having me come in today. Um, that was an amazing worship. Oh, I definitely you. felt the Holy Spirit here. And um, God, I, first of all, I didn't know you had a voice like that. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it was just amazing. I mean, I'm just... I just was thinking, I worked for the school district for about 25 years. I was a district mental health specialist and oversaw the mental health. Well, I was a school counselor forever, um, kindergarten through uh, seniors, and have worked in three different schools in Lake County. But I also worked in New York, Nevada, and then we ended up in Florida. Okay. And then um, I took a position. I became a licensed therapist, um, and then I went back into the school system because I've yeah. always loved, I've always loved mental health and education. Yeah. And so went back into the school system, took a position as a district mental health specialist and oversaw the mental health programs, yeah. primarily in the high schools. Okay. Um, and then I resigned in September. Yeah. So I have an amazing story. I have my husband with me, Rob. We've been married for 30 something <laughs> years. <laughs> we, Whatever uh, it is, it's amazing. <laughs> When did we get 1993, right? Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Yeah. And we were not Christians yeah, at that point. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's quite an interesting story. Um, but my husband, and I have my son with us, our middle son, Brandon, awesome. <laughs> who just got accepted to U.S. medical school program. Very so cool. we're excited Very about cool. that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so. Two years before I resigned, the Lord had, um, you know, he had been calling me out to go into private practice, and mm -hmm. it was just scary to leave yes. the school system, to leave, you know, the retirement, the, the oh, insurance, yeah. and all, there. We <laughs> all of that stuff. <laughs> um, but then my husband actually got cancer, mm -hmm. and the cancer was in his, uh, it's multiple myeloma, and it went into his T6 vertebrae. And then that, during the radiation, it went into the spine and cut off his spinal cord. Ugh. So the doctor told my husband that he would never walk again. Ugh. So I don't know if you guys saw him, like, walk in. He did in, walk in. <laughs> he's walking. Uh, <laughs> still struggling with neuropathy, so still, you know, hoping for healing and yeah. still asking for complete healing. Um, but it's amazing what the Lord has done. He was in a yes. power chair. He was told he would never walk again. Uh, and it's interesting because I had been praying. One of the things that I had asked the Lord is, you know, is, is, is healing, like it says it in scripture, right. you've healed. <laughs> and I don't, I mean, I guess in mental health, but people don't really see that as healing. Right. Um, but there's amazing right. healing in the area of mental there health. There is, there is. In addition to physical health. So anyways, that's a little who, who we are. Very cool. 
So yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. Okay, good, good. Okay, so as we keep going, we're not going to do a live Q&A or anything, but we thank you for people who have sent in. We didn't want to put her on the spot like that, but we're just going to walk through these questions together. If you take notes, if you hear something good, please feel free to do that. This is We don't want this to be viewed as something different than a regular Sunday because the Holy Spirit's here. He's with us. He's guiding our conversation in these answers, and we want this to be beneficial to your family. Okay, so first, um, how would you define mental health? How would you define it? Okay, so first of all, I would focus on the word health. Okay. When yeah. people talk about mental health, typically they're talking about mental illness. Right. Right. And so, the opposite. true. Right. <laughs> so we. So mental health, and I kind of look at mental as in cognitive processes, mm -hmm. how we think, and emotional yes. health, how we feel. So connected. It's very connected. And a lot of that's connected to gut health, but I'm not proficient in that, so I'm yes. not going to speak on that. <laughs> but, you know, when we think about, um, I do, I'm a trauma therapist, so I do a yes. lot on the nervous system. Mm -hmm. So the brain, the, the spine, the nervous system, the yes. gut, they're all connected. Yeah. Um, so... Mental and emotional health to me is, I kind of follow the World Health Organization's okay. definition of it, mm -hmm. which is um, it's mental wellness. Yeah. It's the ability to cope with stress. And I, it's really like your ability to live, love, laugh, and learn yeah. um, and, and be able to function and be yes. a contributing member yes. of society. Yeah. So that is what mental health mm -hmm. is. A lot of times when people think about it, we think about mental ill health. Right. When we have an, when, when there's we, a diagnosis or some crazy symptom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's important to think about signs and symptoms. So signs is something that we can see mm -hmm. with other people. We notice things. Yeah. And a symptom is what a person expresses as what they're feeling okay. inside. Okay. Right? Yeah. So if you go to a doctor because you don't feel well, it's kind of the same thing as a person going to yes. a, a mental health counselor. Yes. I don't, I don't feel well. Like I feel like my, you know, my thoughts are all yeah. over the place. I yes. feel extremely overwhelmed. Yes, or um, very negative. I have a negative kind of loop in my head. Yes. or whatever it is. Yeah, yes. yeah. And so it's really the um, when you're having difficulties with functioning, it okay. could affect your relationships, your work. Yeah. Um, just your daily living experiences. Yeah. So when your mental and emotional health is affecting that, yeah. Yeah. it's probably good to reach out to someone Definitely. for some help. Yeah, focus on the health part of it, the positive, what can be healed, what can grow. I love that. So the next question is, we have made large strides in culture at large in America, I think, in the way we look at mental health or mental illness or therapy. But do you believe there is still a stigma with mental health? And then what about specifically the church? Because that's where we are today. What, do you, what have you seen or experienced when it comes to stigma? around mental health yeah well obviously I just kind of talked about one of them yes. mental health um, people think about ill health yes. and in the church what I have found is that not that we're not supposed to pray we're supposed to bring everything to the Lord yes. but there are many times where I've had I've even had yeah. <laughs> pastors or yeah. you know different people within the church yeah. who have been told you know just pray about it. Right. You're going to be fine, <laughs> you know, yes. or, or it's a sin condition. Uh -huh. Like, you, 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 you know, have you have faith. created, mm -hmm. yes, and you don't have mm -hmm. enough faith yeah. to be, to be healed. Yes. So, yes. yeah. Okay. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Okay. So what contributes to poor mental health? Are there risk factors? Can mental health issues run in your family? Uh, well, there are genetic conditions that yes. they have found. Um, yeah. I primarily, like I said, I'm, a, I'm more of a trauma therapist. Yeah. So I primarily work with actually people that have ha had more of a, a complex trauma, yeah. which is like a series of yes. events that could be considered traumatic. Yes. And mostly with early childhood. So um, yeah. 
you know, people who maybe have had a parent that has a mental health condition and yes. they've grown up with that. Witness a lot of things. Parent is yeah. in prison. Um, there's been child abuse or neglect. Yeah. There might be sexual abuse. So yeah. all these kind of things can mm -hmm. um, affect a person's mental and emotional health. Yeah. Not only that, but with early childhood trauma, what they have found is the, the HPA axis, the hypothalamus, pituitary, and adrenal glands mm -hmm. are affected because there's this there's this chronic stress response that's yes. just going on <laughs> re, like over and over again. Yes. And that's why we see a lot of people with autoimmune deficiencies yes. um, and struggles because their endocrine system, their their hormone and neurotransmitters have been kind of thrown off balance. Yes, we've talked about that a lot. And I, I find myself sometimes when I'm praying for people in prayer, um, trying to um, reiterate or reaffirm to people that you weren't designed for this. Mm. You weren't designed to carry mm. this. You weren't designed to have this stress loop or for someone to be speaking to you that way or abusing you in that way. Our body was not made for that. And that's why it feels so foreign. That's why it's so hard. That's why it's so stressful. And it affects our bodies in multiple ways. In some of my um, stuff that I experienced, years ago um, I had weird symptoms like my fingernails stopped growing <laughs> just weird things like that when you're going through a, a long period of trauma and things are happening to you that are not normal it can affect you in multiple ways and look very different for everybody yeah okay well and I just since we're in a church yeah <laughs> yeah um, because I don't talk about this kind of thing normally in the right. secular world. But, you know, we were talking about uh, mental health, like not being a sin condition. Yes. Right? Yes. Although I would add to, to that that sometimes, like you said, we're carrying, it may not be the sin that we put on ourselves, yeah. but maybe the sin of another person and what yes. they put on us. And exactly. then we're carrying that with us. Yeah. So, you know, I just wanted to Yeah, that. no, definitely, definitely. Okay, so on the opposite then, if there are things that contribute to poor mental health, what are some things that contribute to good mental health and are there pre protective and preventative factors? I know it would probably be a lot of the opposite of what you said, but if you're looking in a room of parents and people who have co-workers, um, but anybody who is close to them and is important in their life, what are some things that we can do to uh, look at pro protective and preventative measures for good mental well, health? Well, they've actually found that one of the best protective factors is having at least one person that you can go to and talk to. Yes. Um, one person that cares about you. Yes. Um, so that's probably one of the best things we can do is just be caring yes. and sit with someone Empathetic. in their pain. Uh -huh. Empathy. Yeah. Yep. We've talked about too, and I guess in Christianese, you would, you maybe heard us use the word accountability. Like you need to have somebody who you can go to if you're struggling, somebody who really sees you, not the mask you put on, not the, oh, I'm fine. I'm blessed of the Lord. <laughs> but who you can really go to and say, man, we are struggling. Are we nuts? <laughs> We've had those moments. Like, are we crazy or are other people going through this too? Because this feels wild, right? But in isolation, as Spencer said this yesterday, isolation is the devil's playground. It's so true because God designed us for community and to be known and to be seen and to be loved. And when that opposite of that happens and we think I'm alone in this I can't tell anybody what would they think how would I even be able to voice this you start putting up walls putting up walls putting up walls and before you know nobody can even get to you even if they're trying right and so that's an important part is opening up to somebody anything else you can think of anything I mean in culture like self-love you know, self-care is the big thing. And there is a balance, I believe, where that's positive. But what would you say, um, anything else about preventative or protective? Yeah, I mean, taking care of yourself, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> self, self, taking care of yourself is a form of self-love. And um, I think there's a difference between the nar like the narcissistic self that is just totally focused on oneself, which a lot of times that's what isolation is. Yeah. Um, it's like an internalized pride right. 
if you think about it. Very true, or <laughs> false humility, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so taking care of yourself, that can look like, you know, what you're putting in your mouth, taking care of your body, having, being in relationship with other people. So all of th those kind of things. Being in nature, I think nowadays we're so busy um, that we forget to take time to just be outside and breathe and take in the beauty of what's around us and all of those things. To be thankful. You talked about like open your mouth and uh -huh. just be thankful for everything. Yes. <laughs> it's amazing what happens when you just start focusing your attention on the things that you're thankful for, even if they're little tiny things. It's amazing what will happen to the brain. It shifts. And because we so easily focus on and magnify the negative unconsciously. Mm -hmm. And it just plays in our head. And sometimes it's with me, it's stress and worry. I let the fear of the future, something that's not in my control maybe, that I need to give to God, but I let it just loop, loop, loop fear. Worst case scenario, worst mm -hmm. case scenario. And next thing I know, it, it didn't turn out that way. Yeah. It's okay, right? Come on, God was watching. He was opening doors I didn't know, and he was working on things, right? And so there is, there's some of that. So since we're going to, go ahead. I'm just going to add, um, in terms of depression and anxiety, a lot of times uh, depression, when someone is in a depression, it's because they're, they're really focused on the past. Yes. All of the things that have gone wrong, uh -huh. you okay. know, all of that. And, and a lot of times anxiety is more about the future, yes. the worry. So learning That's how good. to live in That's the true. moment I've is never really, thought about and that. just being grateful for what's in front of you, yes. really important. That's good. So before I ask the Bible verse one, since we're in this vein, we have some people in here and in the, this day and age, I think it's so important. What can parents do to support their kids or teens mental health? The, the, probably the best thing they can do is take care of their own mental health. Okay, good. That's number that's one. First. Yes. That's <laughs> take first. care of your own mental health. There's something out there called emotional coaching okay. and I refer it to my parents a lot because it's all about learning how to identify your own emotions and what your body is feeling right. and being able to name those emotions and then helping your kids know how to do the same thing. I mean, there's a lot of adults that I work with. Right. They're not able to <laughs> name their emotions. Yes. And I say, yes. where do you feel that in the, their body, your body? And they're like, I know. <laughs> I remember the first time you asked me that. I was like, what do you mean? Like, it's just in my head. <laughs> like, what do you mean I feel bad? And she's like, no, notice your, how you're sitting, your posture. And I'm like, oh, I guess like my neck or like my shoulders feel tight or like you start to carry it. Is there anybody in here who, when they get stressed, like clenches their jaw? Have you ever noticed that? Clenching your jaw. A lot of people get TMJ or if you're going through something really stressful at night, you'll notice you're, you're getting sore. Our body has an amazing wild reaction to different stress. So, okay. So taking care of the parents' mental health first. Okay. Anything yeah. else? And then just being able to speak and name emotions and help your kids like learn how to have a voice um, and to be able to kind of notice and talk through what yes. they're experiencing. Because a lot of times kids are just, they're just reacting, right? right? <laughs> One just big reacting. ball of reaction <laughs> all the time. Yes. And it's important to notice one of my favorite things that we used to do in the school system, we taught something with the younger kids, something called conscious discipline, okay. which is very different than traditional discipline. And it's really based on three parts of that, that brain and nervous system we were talking about. So the first thing a child wants to know is, am I safe? Right, right. Right? And if I'm not safe, yeah. I, I'm already dysregulated. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then you know, do I belong? Right. And so am I connected to my community and, yeah. and where I am and how do I fit in? What is my role? Yeah. And then the third part is like, now I can think. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, but if the, am I safe and do I belong? If they're not in play, it is very hard for a child to be able to think. Yes. yes. And a lot of times as parents, where we come to them, do you understand what you did? Well, now you're speaking about understanding. Right. Like they, <laughs> right. That's and a just, higher level yes. process. Yes. Yeah, definitely. I feel like a lot of times when we're experiencing something, there's this surfle, surface level emotion. Like, I am so angry, right? I'm ticked off. I'm reacting. I'm yelling, whatever it is. 
But underneath that is the real emotion, whether it's betrayal, embarrassment, right? Something like that that's underneath it, that I'm outwardly showing anger or sadness, but on the inside, there's something a lot deeper that is at the root of it. And that is, it's, it's a good thing to be able to teach. It takes time, but I think that's a great word. It's yeah. important for our kids and our teenagers. And you were talking about anger. So we typically, in our field, typically look at anger like a secondary emotion. So okay. yeah. there's usually something, something underneath, underneath the anger. It. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so back to this one. What is your favorite Bible verse that speaks to mental health? Okay, well, I had all of these that I wrote down, yes. you know. There's a lot. <laughs> I was like, to be with the brokenhearted, that's my heart. Yes, yes. Um, you know, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden, such Matthew a good one. 11, mm -hmm. right? And so, and there's all these like change, you know, whatever is lovely, whatever is pure, like think yes. on these things. Yes. Um, but honestly, as I was driving over here, the, the Lord kept pressing on me, Jesus wept. Yes, yes. Jesus wept. The shortest verse in the Bible, yes, yes. Yeah, and I was like, yeah, that's that's really it. Like, he he was God, came in human form, yes. and he loved mm -hmm. Lazarus. Yep, and grieved. And grieved him, yes. even though he, would, he knew he was bringing him back to life, and he was only sleeping. One of the you know? most interesting Bible verses, I think, in the whole Bible. It's yeah. so true. Knowing the whole context of the story that he was about to heal and raise him from the dead, but yeah. he wept. And he wept. He was with him. And in he was that empathizing, moment. I believe, with his sisters, Mary and Martha, with the people around him because they had all been grieving him for days. Mm -hmm. And so Jesus wept. So Jesus knows it. He knows. The silent tears you've laid in a bed at night that have filled your ears. He sees the anger and the animosity you've stored in your heart for somebody who's wronged you. He sees the anxiety you feel when you're coming up on a new job or a switch in career or whatever it is. He sees that. He experienced that on earth. And he can know and understand and empathize with you. I think that's incredibly important. Yeah. Just want to just you were making me think. So yeah. I was telling you guys that um, my husband was in the hospital and when he was there, you know, he was paralyzed and they were having to pick him up with one of those. I forget what they're a called. Lift Hoyer thing. lift. Yes. Right. Move him around. And we were there for a good two to three months. And I'm like, I was so overwhelmed because I'm like, what? What do we do now? Right. And so I was just laying there crying, and I was reading a book by Lisa Turkerist. Okay, yes. And she had this one chapter, and it was called Dust. And she shared um, this one paragraph. She said, what do you do when your life is like a coffee mug, and it drops on the floor? Yeah, <laughs> so no. And it's Bad not day. in bit. I mean, she's like, if there's still pieces, you can right. glue it back together. Yes. She goes, but what happens when the cup drops and it turns to dust? Right. And I, I and the, in that moment, Ouch. I was like, God, that's how I feel. Like, yes. that's where I'm at. Yeah. And then in the next moment, she was like, but God loves dust. Yes. He created he us out of life dust. life into dust. Yeah. And in a minute, I, yeah. all of my worries just, yes. I was like, just, it'll be, it'll be whatever yes. he wants it to be. Yes. <laughs> yes. The Bible says he brings beauty from ashes. That's another symbol of dust that he does. He's working in the midst of the pain and the wreckage and the mess that life throws at us. He's always with us. Amen. Yeah. Amen. And it's interesting that you guys did that song because as we were, uh, as you were worshiping and we were worshiping, um, that is what came to me. Like, I don't know if there's anyone in here struggling or feels like their life is yeah. in ashes, yeah. but I really felt the spirit here and felt like he was really ministering to, to someone in this room that he is going to make a beauty from your ashes. Amen. So. That's so good. That's so good. Amen. Huh? Oh, yes. Go ahead. He's got some. He's got some. <laughs> Sorry. Preacher. So, they asked, what's your favorite Bible verse? And we're in this series called It Runs in My Family, right? And so this scripture that it comes from, I was just reading, it's in 2 Timothy 1, verses 3 through 7. It says, I thank God whom I serve with a pure conscience as my forefathers did, as without ceasing I remember you in my prayers night and day, 
greatly desiring to see you being mindful of your tears. I love that. That I may be filled with joy. When I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is within you, right? This is the, the, tr the crux passage for this series is verse 5 and 6. It says, when I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded is in you also. Verse 6 says, therefore I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of hands. And verse 7 says this, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Yeah, right. And I just thought I had to share that because yeah, this mind. is the scripture, right? We've been talking about it runs in our family. <laughs> He's not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. That's good. Okay, so let's dive in a little bit. Um, since we don't have a ton of time, let's dive in specifically to the family. So um, what are some signs of dangerous behavior that we could see in our loved ones, our family close to us, whether it's a sign of maybe um, like some kind of suicidal thoughts, maybe our teens or um, a spouse is struggling with depression. What are some like of those, maybe not signs, maybe symptoms or whatever, whichever term terminology you're saying that we might be able to catch on the outside that could be a red flag for us? So the biggest red flag is when you notice a change in behavior. Okay. That's the biggest red flag. So if you have a child that, you know, is around, like, first of all, if they're a teenager, they're never around. <laughs> they're always in their room or they're at a friend's house or whatever, right? Uh, but if, if they're all of a sudden just, like, totally missing and, you know, uh, maybe their grades are coming down or... I, you know, just you're noticing changes. You like know your parents know their children more, more than anybody else. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. So you changes changes in behavior, and you just kind of want to pay attention. We have it, at the end. I know you're going to ask me about mental health first aid. So now's a really good time to just mention that. Yeah. So um, uh, I do a training called mental health first aid. So you yes. know how there's basic CPR and first yeah. aid. Yeah. Um, where people can get trained to be a first responder. Well, we have a mental health first aid uh, training. That's it's so good. It's a one day training, um, and I there's sign up sheets in the back. We're gonna be there's some going on now, but we're okay. planning one in August. Okay. Um, but that course actually tells you like um, what what to notice, okay. what signs and symptoms to look for. How do you approach? What's the best way to approach? Um, how do you give reassurance? Okay. Yeah. Um, how do you um, help someone come up with like their own coping techniques and yes. their own strategies? And then how do you know how to refer someone out yes. for professional help? Yeah. So that's, that's awesome. there if anybody wants more information that's on that. Great. That's a great tool. Yeah. Okay. So when it comes to our family, we've all been there for some reason or another, a big blow up happens. Somebody didn't do something they were supposed to do. Somebody didn't come home at the time they were supposed to come home. Or maybe a schedule change or something happens. And the next thing you know, the house is in conflict. Fighting, maybe yelling. Um, things are coming to a head. We're talking about in the heat of the moment. How can we develop some rules of engagement for within our home when conflict and tension rise up? So the first thing you can do is be preventive. Yes. So to set up a to set up a system ahead of time, okay. so that everybody knows what the expectations are. Yeah. Um, some non-negotiables. We're not going to cuss at each other, or some some things on the front end that we is an understanding. Yeah. And conflict is normal. That's true. Conflict is yes. normal. <laughs> it's going to happen. Um, so I think you know it's important for everybody to kind of within themselves. Like, how do they feel about conflict? Because if you struggle with conflict and you're, you're probably going to be a person that avoids it yes. and shove it under the rug right. until you <laughs> cannot uh -huh. get around the rug anymore. And then it blows up. And yeah. then it blows up. So learning to be okay, that conflict, all it means is there's tension because there's, most of the time it's because there's different belief systems. Yeah. Um, it's true. I right. thought you should do it this way. You thought we should do it this way. There's a tension because of an unmet expectation or something. Right. Yeah. 
Right. And so that goes back again to being able to regulate your own emotions. So if you need, you know, when you have a brand new baby, they tell the mother or father, whoever's taking care of the baby, like if you are dysregulated, put it's yeah. okay to leave the baby put in the, the baby crib, in the safe space in the and safe walk, space, away. walk away, get your breath and then come back when you're ready. And the same thing is true when there is a conflict. I'm, I don't know why I'm thinking teenagers, maybe because we're in middle school. No, yeah, it's um, true. But, you know, we can do the same thing. We don't always have to respond. Yes. Or I should say react because react. there's a difference between reacting yes. and responding. That's good. Mm -hmm. um, so you don't always have to, rea to respond until you're ready. Yeah. And then do, you know, I have on my... On my signature, I have regulate, re relate, reason. Okay. In those, in that order, and it goes back to yes. what we were talking about. Regulate the brain. yourself. Regulate yeah. yourself. Yeah. And then, as you regulate yourself, hopefully, your child is yes. also regulating that their selves. Yes. And then you relate. Yeah. Okay. Let's talk about where we're at. I love you. Yeah. Right. I love you. I care about you. Yep. It's really important that we talk about this. Yes. And then you reason. Okay. Then you come to that. Try there's to see a parenting each other's side or whatever it is. Yeah. There's a parenting program. Um, so I have one of my children, but, but my my first and my last son. Yes. Uh, yeah, we went through this regularly. Yes. And we still are in their <laughs> mid twenties. <kinda>. Yes. <laughs> um, but. You know, there there is a parenting program called Love and Logic Parenting, yes, yes, and I I've am a huge of fan of it. I've uh, Doc Amen talks about that. I love Doc Amen. Follow him, and then he that's he loves yeah, yeah Love and Logic. Yeah. So you want to focus on you want to be loving, but it's also okay for kids to experience the co the natural consequences yes. that follow their yes. actions. I know I've heard him say time and time again that if there's anything I can leave a parent with, because there's all kinds of methods of parenting, gentle parenting, uh, not gentle parenting, you know, there's a spectrum of things, but I've heard him say the two words that I need a parent to remember is to be kind and firm. You are not a doormat. Your kid can't just do whatever they want but there you need to be kind and firm. You set the boundaries, but you do it in a kind, loving way. I believe that's what Jesus showed us time and time again, to be honest. Well, and that just made me think about the truth in love. Right, right, exactly. It's the same thing. That's how you're supposed to handle with people, yeah. Okay, well, let's switch a little bit. What can I say to help someone I love who's struggling with anxiety? In the moment, what can I do to help them? Or maybe preventative if something could set them off or something. Yeah, so remember, the nerve, you're bringing your nervous system. So when you and yeah. I come together, if you are feeling really anxious and overwhelmed, the best thing that I can do is bring a calm nervous system yes. into your presence. Yes. So I can just make sure that I'm regulating myself, slow down. You kind, We have mirror neurons in our brain, actually. Interesting. And... And I, my goal what would I be to get you to mirror yes. my, my nervous system. Okay. So um, you would just approach in a calm way, yeah. notice them. Yes. I'm here for you. If you, if you would like to talk, you know, just leave kind of an open-ended space for yeah. someone to be able to share. Okay. That's yeah. great. That's great. Okay. How do I know the difference if I'm maybe seeing something in my kids or my spouse, someone I love, how do I know the difference between what is depression and what is sadness? Because I love the fact that culture is a lot more accepting of mental health. We're talking about it a lot more now, but it also becomes a blanket term that's put over everybody. Mm -hmm. so oh, is, so I'm is so trauma. depressed. My trauma, my triggers, not that people can't have those, they do, but it's kind of getting hard in some, maybe in your teenager's life, the boy who cried wolf a little bit, right? Or the girl who cried wolf. What is the difference between depression and sadness? Yeah. So really what I was talking about earlier, um, depression is, someone who is super stuck like you're going to notice it because their sleep is affected their yes. eating is affected their functioning their ability to function okay they're they're just overwhelmed with it it's almost like a weight and they're like a person's in quicksand and they're they're just not able to get out on their own so depression depression has to um 
in order to be di diagnosed, you have to have been experiencing things, these things for at least a two-week period. Okay. okay. Yeah. And it's very common, too, that depending on what you're going through, if you're going through a really hard, maybe you're going through like a yes. really bad divorce, <laughs> right? Right. And right. you are depressed. You cannot function. Mm -hmm. And so you might actually get a diagnosis of major depressive disorder. Yes. Um, and six months later, right. never have that diagnosis again. Yes. It could be circumstantial. It could be circumstantial. But it could still be depression. Yes. Yes. Okay. Awesome. I just listened to a podcast. I don't know. Do you guys remember the famous dancer Twitch? from So You Think You Can Dance. He was this famous dancer. It was kind of big when I was growing up, and he um, he committed suicide. He has a whole family, young kids, and he committed suicide. It was all over the news um, because he he was, like, on the Ellen Jenner show. He was this guy that brought this loving high energy similar to a Robin Williams kind of thing, the last guy you would have thought, right, has a very young family. And I just watched a podcast with an interview of his wife, and they asked her, what are some things that you saw ahead of time? And she said the only main thing, he wasn't doing a great job of opening up with us, but he had times where he'd be positive, 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 and just giving the love and outpouring to other people kind of drained him. And she said he wasn't good at then refueling himself. He was just giving everything away, and it would drain him. And she said that she noticed a few months before um, he took his life that he um, would sleep and sleep. She said he couldn't get through a work day without taking a really long nap. And he would go and into his room and just sleep and sleep. It even got to the point where at his workplace, he would have to nap in the middle of the afternoon. And she said that was one of the biggest signs that she just, um, she didn't see uh, that, well, that she saw, but she didn't bring up or um, bring to somebody as a red flag. Yeah. So a big thing that's going on in the mental health community is they've actually, cause just because you said this word, it made me think about it. Yes. You said committing, committed suicide, yes. right? Yes. So yes. there's a big thing in the community, uh, mental health community, that they're not using that, that word anymore because okay. it, they... Yeah. It's kind of being attached to like, I've committed a sin, I've committed yeah. a, a crime, yes, yes. you know. So they're using like the word died by, died by okay. suicide. Yeah. So yeah. I, I would want to say that um, yeah. when someone is to the place where they're suicidal. So first of all, with depression, yeah. thoughts of suicide is actually common, believe it or not. Yeah. Because, and it comes out like this. I wish... Okay. I didn't have to be here. Yes. I wish I wasn't going through this. Yes. Right? So there's the thought, if yes. I was not here, mm -hmm. then I would not have to go through that. So we're always doing a, a risk assessment for suicide. Okay. Yes. So if someone has thoughts of suicide, but there's no plan of action, right. they've never a attempted before, yes. they, and they tell you to your face, like, yeah, I wish that, but right. no, I'm not going to do it. Right. Then they're very, they're a lower, they're still risk, gotcha. but it's a low risk. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it's so complex. It is complex. Very layered. But it's very, suicide is very serious because I don't know if you guys know this, but among 10 to 34 year olds, suicide is the second leading cause of death. Oh my goodness. Second leading cause of death. You said 10? 10, 10 age 10. 10 to 34. Wow. So we teach people, um, and all of the teachers in Lake County, yes. were you trained in base? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, we teach people to notice signs. Yes. And uh, we have a pro they have a process in Lake County of okay. how they handle that if okay. they have students that yes. are um, showing so risk. You know, a lot of schools have mental health liaison. Our yes. neighbor is one. Yes. Yep. Okay. Um, but if you're not in the school system and you're like it's a neighbor or your own child yeah. or, or a grandchild or something, um, you want to be equipped to ask the question, are you thinking about suicide? A lot of people yeah. think that they're going to put that into someone's head right. when <laughs> that's a myth. You're, True. If, okay. if someone doesn't, and I've asked the question a million times, if someone is not thinking about it, they're like, no, no. miss. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> right? right? Like, no. Um, yeah. But because, because it's the second leading cause of death, we need to be asking the asking. question. 
Yes. Okay. Okay, good. All right. We're going to finish off with two. So I'm going to skip one or two. So where can I go to look for a therapist? What is a good tool? Is there an online website? Is there a good way to search? What is a good way to look for a therapist for me or my family member or something? Well, the first way is word of mouth. <laughs> yes, okay. So if yeah. you know somebody who's been to a therapist, yes. that they liked that therapist, they felt comfortable with them, yeah. then that is probably the best method to go. Yes. Um, it's you, almost like having a review on <laughs> Amazon or something, right? Yeah, like I yeah. had a positive experience with this person. Yeah. Yeah. Um, another way, Psychology Today okay. is a website and you can put like wherever you live, you can put your insurance if you're using insurance. Okay. Um, and look for local therapists in the area. Um, you know, you can go to your churches and yes. ask, ask, people, yes, your yep. pastors, if they know anybody. Yep. So those are probably the main ways. Awesome. Awesome. And I do want to say that too, as a, a church leader, it's really important to point that out. There are some, but most pastors are not licensed therapists or counselors. Mm -hmm. And so if you're going to a pastor for help or for therapy, and they're using that terminology, you need to ask them if they're certified <laughs> because most pastors aren't. We have done pastoral care. We've called it in the past in helping couples or giving advice or talking to teenagers but pastors are not licensed therapists. There's a lot of spiritual um, direction, yes, we can give, but we, especially Spencer and I, we have always come together and said there are some things that you, you should go to a therapist about because they are trained. God has called them. There is a level of um, schooling or education, whatever it is that they have gone through, that is a lot different, right? Okay. I would also ask questions. Yes. You are the customer. 100%. I actually, I, um, many therapists call their clients patients. Yeah. And yes. I have trained our, we have, I have a couple other therapists in my office. Um, we call our clients clients. Yes. Um, yeah. and so you can, you have the right to ask them, you know, what kind of worldview they have. Like, yeah. obviously I have a bi biblical worldview. Yes. Now I don't push my belief yes. system on my clients, right. I always ask, you know, do you have a spirituality that you follow? Yes. Okay. Um, and yep. if they are a Christian, I'll ask, well, do you, do you read the Bible? Yeah. <laughs> Just to know the, where they are. <laughs> where they're at. Yeah. <laughs> um, yep. And then the other thing with therapists, I brought some of these. These are just different flip charts. Um, not every therapist has training in the techniques that you may want right. for your situation. Yes, yes. Right? Like you were saying trauma, that's kind of your background, which you kind of specialize in. Yes. Yeah. Like I'm just going to give you an, inst an instance. Yeah. Um, I use one of my favorite techni techniques is EMDR. Yes. Right? Yep. But I'm EMDR does require <laughs> some imagery, a person's ability to like imagine things in their head. Yes. And I have one client that said... I don't imagine things like I, oh. I see things in words, but I, I can't visualize things. Uh -huh. So I am also trained in cognitive processing therapy. Okay. So yeah. I said, OK, well, let's take this other approach. And, you know, that works for him. So yeah. it's really important to know, like, what it, what is the issue that you're dealing with? And then what is the counselor trained in? Yes. Like, what are their uh, uh, favorite techniques to use? Yeah. Okay. Awesome. All right. Before we end, is there anything else? You did explain a little bit about mental health first aid, but can you just, anything else you want to say about it? Or um, like you said, you have a table kind of in the back people can sign up for just anything else that you didn't get to say that you want to say about that before we close? Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So go ahead. Make sure before you head out, we are going to have a uh, um, cookies after service. We're putting out crumble cookies. We want you to stay, hang out a little bit, but see her table. Check out some of the resources she has and stuff like that. Everybody give her a hand clap, a stand as we close. Thank her so much for being here. Thank you. I can take that from you as I close. I think that was awesome. It's a great, great opportunity for us to just learn a little bit more, take some practical stuff in because we all have a mental health of some sort. 
We all have a brain. We all have emotions. We all have things that affect us and affect the people around us. And so it's important to not ignore that stuff, but to get some tools under our belt to be able to make sure we are passing on the same, the good, the positive, the faith building things in our family. Amen. Okay. So I'm going to first, um, first I'm going to pray. And so I want everybody to go ahead and we want to do this privately. Go ahead, close your eyes. If you are struggling or someone that you in your life is struggling with mental health, I'm going to say a prayer over mental health right now. And I'd love anybody who's struggling with that right now, who struggles with anything, whether it's a diagnosis like anxiety or depression, or whether it is um, you are walking through a really hard season or a transition, or your kids are, go ahead and raise your hand now. And I just want to be able to see your hands as I pray. Dear Lord, you see the hands in these rooms. Lord, each hand is representative of a story, each one so unique and so different, but each person so beautifully created by you, each with a purpose and a plan, each with something that you want them to do in their lives. They are each so beautifully and wonderfully yours. So Lord, I pray that you would strengthen them. Lord, I pray that you would heal their minds and their hearts. Lord, I pray that you would bring to remembrance what it is that called them to you, God, in the first place. I pray that whatever it is that is binding them, holding on to them, that is chaining them or maybe keeping them in a cycle of repetition of something negative, I pray that you would break that off of them in Jesus' name this morning. I pray that instead they would receive confidence, that they would receive self-esteem, that they would receive health and healing because you want healing for our bodies and that is your will just as much as you do for our emotions, our minds, and our relationship. No one here in this room is alone. Not only do we have you, God, but we have each other. So help us to be vulnerable. Help us to be accountable. And when things aren't going good, it's okay to say, I'm not okay. So Lord, help us to do that this morning. We lay these things at your feet and we ask you to open the right doors, whether it is therapy or medication or miraculous divine healing, whatever it is, we will take the path because you want us to be whole and healthy and better all together. Amen. Amen. All right. So as we close here, we're going to close the same ways that we usually do, whether you are in person or online. If you do not know Jesus Christ, this Savior we talked about who wept, who empathized, who came to earth, Um, As a human, we'd love to give you that opportunity if you have been thinking about receiving Christ into your heart or you are far away from him and it is time to rededicate your life, you can do that today. So if everybody would close their eyes, Lord, we are so thankful that you are with us. If there's anybody in this room who would love to give their lives to you, you can raise your hand. If you're watching online, please reach out online. Send Story Church a message, and we would like to pray with you. So we're going to pray all together. This is just a prayer that says, God, you know, I just want you. I'm tired of doing life alone. I'm tired of doing it out of my own works and my own striving. I want to do it out of your power. So we're going to repeat this prayer together. This is the salvation prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for what you did for me. I reject and let go of my sin. And I accept your love. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. And today I choose to live for you. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. All right. As we close, like I said, make sure, please, you check out some of the stuff in the back. We have all kinds of milk for all of my friends, whether you do dairy or don't do dairy, whether you like a chocolate or you like a vanilla. We got all kinds of stuff. So I want you to grab a crumble cookie. I'm going to quickly pray over our offering. 
the way that we get to put God first in our finances, another form of worship. And so if you are a guest of Story Church, this is not specifically for you. This is for our in-house people, the people who call Story Church home. Um, if you would ask God what he would have you give. We're so thankful for the fact that Story Church is happening today because of you guys. It's helping us do all the things we're doing this summer, like recess, like the um, free lunch. And so we're going to pray over that and then you'll be released. Thank you, Lord, for everything you're doing in the finances of Story Church. Thank you for each individual family. You see what they're going through right now. You see the stress that is revolved around money. That's a whole nother mental health topic. Lord, finances and jobs and uh, what should we spend on? What should we save? All of the stress that comes with it. But Lord, we know that money is a tool we use for the kingdom. And so we use it in our lives to put you first in another way, in our finances, in our time, in our um, worship, in our learning. We put you first in all of it. And we thank you for blessing us and for being a part of this service. Thank you for being with us today and being a God that always shows up. You're always there. You're so faithful. You're so faithful. And we thank you for being with us this morning. Amen. Amen. Thank you guys for joining us. We are so glad that you came. You are released. Have an amazing, amazing week and an awesome summer. Amen. Amen.